80s gets made into a movie in the early 50s. And then we also have like a, a lot of uh, Mission to Mars uh, movies that were probably quite interesting. We had some hyper-realistic ones where they, they basically take a flying wing to Mars <coughs> so they can land and then take off again. And then we have the, 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 the funny ones where they, the giant jellyfish with a revolving eye. <laughs> some dead civilization over there. I never quite got that, but it's interesting from a yeah. cultural standpoint. Well, it gets back to the different Yeah, well, from my point of view, the whole ancient cultures thing and ancient intelligent civilizations thing comes, for me, from the line of the monkey python and the meaning of life. I pray that there's intelligent life somewhere out in space, because we bugger all down here on Earth. Yeah. Um, you know, we want to think that there's some sort, you know, there's some sort of group, greater design or something that gives any of this meaning. Um, we don't want to be, at one level, we don't want to be alone. Um, on the other level, having having strange faces on other planets uh, gives gives the people who who live in what Sagan referred to as the demon haunted world. Someone say, ah, that's a sign that that's where Satan is. You know, I mean, it's something that everyone can interpret into something that corresponds to their worldview that's self-confirming. Yeah, a visible manifestation of the off-world other. Yeah. Yeah, because it wasn't just, it was the face of Mars and the pyramids of Mars. Yeah. And after we had like a whole spate of like the ghosts of Mars, and there's two or three different Mars exploration movies. There was the one with... Um, Gary Sinise, where they're going to rescue the black guy. And then there was the one where uh, the pulse of the atmosphere starts to improve. And, um, and, they, and they're basically being chased across Mars by their own throat. Yes. Yeah. And then there's the ghost of Mars, which was like a, a Wild West story set on Mars <laughs> completely the railroad. Yeah. It does have a certain hole. Yeah. And I think it's because we can see it, we know what it looks like. And and there's vistas on Mars. Like the one and, and it's like I'm very much like the, I guess you can get back to the new frontier thing. It's like it looks like the old frontier. And we can't and when you look at it in pictures you can't tell that you couldn't breathe the atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah. Well, another thing that I always thought was kind of curious, um, I've gone to a couple I was a part of the uh, Mars Society for a while for almost two decades now pushing for man missions. But uh, it's very interesting discussions come up. A lot of it focuses on the scientific aspects, uh, the technical aspects, far more so than we're going to talk about here, looking more at the sci-fi aspects of it. But I thought it was curious how there were these two camps, and they didn't really recognize, or at least wouldn't acknowledge to each other, that on the one group you have the people that are looking into scientifically studying Mars, how does this... Why is it the way it is? Where's the water? Why isn't it on the surface? Why the F did it have a thicker atmosphere or so ever? Was it in all these sort of like issues about Mars itself? And then there's this other camp that's looking at it primarily from the standpoint of, well, when are we going to go and live there and change this place? And well, to the point of talking about these grandiose terraforming projects. And they're both pushing for these manned missions, even though they're these diametrically opposed end goals that they have. It's right. like if you want to study Mars, you can't go and set up your colonies. Yeah, you can't go, <laughs> you can't terraform and study the ecology at the same time. You have to pick one, because the other one's going to give you a short shrift, whichever way you go. Well, well tell us a little bit more about your, your, your Mars Society experience, because that's an example of an intense example of, of, uh, of Mars' effect on society is it's created this whole subculture of the Mars society. Well, it, um, it really got started back um, when uh, the first Bush, Bush, Bush 41 announced that uh, the United States is going to go to Mars. I remember watching that speech on TV and thinking, oh, well, that's cool, what brought this on? And of course, Congress did their review of it. They came 
came up with this bad Star Galactica budget building these fleets of ships and it was just going to be insane. And, well, no, we can't do that. We don't have money for that. So, end of program. And then uh, this guy, Dr. Zuber, comes along and he's going to try and figure out how to do this on a bare bones kind of budget. He cobbles together this plan called Mars Direct that used a lot of, at the time, off the shelf hardware, you know, a lot of shuttle stuff. And he was estimating that you could send a crew of four astronauts to Mars for a budget of six billion dollars or something, which I think was wildly optimistic at the time. <laughs> but this plan was just showing that you could, if you cut enough corners, <laughs> you yeah. can do it. And it really did change the thinking on it. And a well, few years ago, it was even cheaper if you didn't intend to ever bring the Mars PI yeah. astronauts back. Which is one of the things I was arguing, actually. That yeah. If you can find some volunteers, you just send them with more stuff. But uh, yeah, it changed the thinking on it to the point where NASA a few years later came up with uh, what they call the reference mission, which is a, a beefed up Mars Direct with a crew of six and some more redundancy because they are uh, more concerned with everybody not dying. Yeah. Would be like well, another, I guess that <laughs> it reminds me of another manifestation of Mars in popular culture, uh, Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert Heinlein, where, the, uh, where a human, uh, uh, an expedition like a Mars Direct type of expedition goes to Mars uh, has has some problems, but it's produced a child that's raised by Martians living on Mars, who then comes back to try and integrate, reintegrate with Earth society. And then, so I got So Heinemann uses that person to reflect upon some of the things he finds interesting about our society. But it's like, it's a, um, but I think it's funny, like, because the first expedition is like a, I think it was what a six, it was a very small expedition of couples. And then the next expedition to go and rescue them was like uh, 16 military people, you know, like the, the antithesis of a Mars Direct type mission. It was like a high end, yeah. lots of money spent on it, that sort of thing, because we're going to come right back. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I guess strange, I mean, like in terms of the written stuff, yeah, I mean, um, we were talking about in the earlier in the Hugo's panel, um, and we're talking, and this year we're also voting on the retro Hugo's, were fiction written and published in 1940. And uh, there's a chap in Belgium who's from Britain, uh, Nicholas White's done a survey, and he says it's odd, but most of the stories written that year were either set in New York City or on Mars. And he figures part of it was the, um, the War of the Worlds factor. Uh, War of the Worlds had come up in 39 and was still strong in people's minds. Because 39, and then you're writing stuff in 39 to be published in 40. So there's quite a connection there. I guess. Um, yeah, because like even uh, it wasn't just uh, when we talk about the popular culture too. It's um, it's not just uh, it's like we bracket stories, which are also I think that's where we get Tatooine and Star Wars from. It's from her like space opera type stories about Mars, and there's no crumbling civilization on Tatooine, but it's definitely a, a, a desert environment. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. A lot of those stories are Bradbury stories. That's kind of reflecting on the other side. If anybody ever does go try to colonize that, it's going to be a similar kind of situation where you're going to have these very small groups of people trying to eke a little bit of water out of the ground. Yeah. And it's just, I, don't know, I find it kind of, I mean, I, obviously they weren't writing it from that standpoint. It was straight up fantasy space opera that just happened to say, well, yeah, our setting is Mars. Sure, why not? Well, I guess less so with Bradbury. But, but it was an, I guess it was an accessible setting for the other. You know? Yes, but that it kind of hits on some of the essential points that the reality would reflect. That eventually, if you have people there for more than a generation, then you have your Martians, yeah. and you're going to start getting those yeah, other world people are be, They're natives of Mars, and, and once you grow up on Mars, your your body is adapted to the lower gravity. You're not coming back to Earth anytime soon for very long at all. But even more so than physically, like what are the like the mental landscape that would come with under such different conditions? Because it's, you know, it would be different than any place else. Exactly. Than Earth. Yeah, it would make es Eskimo life look luxurious yes. in comparison. <laughs> what? You don't have to put on a helmet and air tanks <laughs> to go outside. Luxury, I, like most of them. Oh, well, on top of that, I mean, there's just the psychological aspects of, well, probably a 
certain level of agoraphobia because, oh my God, there are all these people, you can't get any privacy. There's all this noise. There's all this stuff if they were to come back here. And of course, there's a question of any... Well, they would be used to some level of noise because their whole environment is artificial. Right, but I'm talking about a human. You like honking, got cars and... Cars, honking, yeah. music, all of that. No ceilings, you know, like your other... Like in Mars, you'd be living in indoors, or you'd be wearing a helmet outdoors. You would never actually uh, not have a roof above you at some point. Right. But for a lot of us, is that really yeah. all that different? <laughs> I remember talking with somebody when I was working an engineering job, talking about how, why would people want to go to Mars? Because they'd just be living in this dome all day. And I'm like, well, I get up and it's dark out, and I walk out to my garage, and I get in my car, and I drive here, and then I walk and I spend all day in this building, and then I go in my car, and then I go back in my house. I, I don't go outside. Yeah. What's the difference? And then, I mean, Drew, you have a wing uh, story by Frederick Paul called The Space Merchants? I've not actually read that. I have a copy of it sitting around that's been there for years. It, 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 it deals with the same question about why anybody would want to go to Venus. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a good question. Well, so there is a, um, a project that has been kicked around about a one-way trip, and there's people who've actually volunteered for that. And yeah. I remember an interview on the public radio, this woman said, yeah, she's ready to go. And they said, well, what about your husband? He says, oh, he's fine with it. Yeah, that, that interview, yeah. Yeah, that, didn't, that, that hasn't panned out. I, I think there were some problems with the funding and exactly how they were going to spend the money and were they actually going to spend the money on anything other than expenses. But uh, I think the other thing that brings up about Elon Musk looks like he wants to go to Mars. Like this, the whole space, the whole goal of SpaceX is to uh, is private uh, space exploration. Just spiral development of all the hardware to have everything that you need to get there. Well, didn't he say he doesn't actually want to go himself? He doesn't think that's going to happen in his lifetime, or uh, maybe? Well, yeah. It, well, I don't know. Like what we talked about, like if you're going to go there to stay, you want to be older. Cause you want to you want to be past your childbearing years. Cause you want to you want to have your kids already born because it's going to mess up your DNA something fierce. Well, that's an interesting question that um, has come up. And I, I was actually fortunate a few years ago to talk to biologists about this. And because I was thinking maybe they would have some kind of theoretical answer. They don't know either. Because nobody knows how mammals develop in partial gravity. And um, there was a program, I guess, 10 or so years ago. So it was a Mars Society. But it was basically this tourist that they were going to send up with some license. Oh, and then just to orbit. Yeah, buy space on one of these commercial launches and send this thing up there and let it circle around for a year. And these mice will breed in this tourist that's spinning to provide Mars level gravity. And just see if it works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is, that's important data to have because we don't know. It would seem like people, a fetus should develop properly one third of Earth gravity, but we have no idea. And maybe something weird happens. We're not really going to know until somebody tries it. And yeah. it's going to I believe that the shuttle is trying to uh, uh, eggs. I'm trying to remember which was a steroid or something. And of course, the flight that still holds the record for the largest number of uh, uh, on board with the uh, was it 17,000 uh, ants or something. <laughs> Well, they're growing, I know they're growing plants now, trying yeah. to grow plants now. Yeah. I think another aspect uh, of our topics is the um, social media and planetary science. And I think, because uh, in a lot of ways, I think Mars was the easiest place, most accessible place to get pictures back. Like, like I said, the Jupiter's pretty far out. Um, Venus doesn't, Venus just is not photogenic. Yeah. <laughs> Mercury just looks like the moon, only farther away. So Mars is pretty much it. We have good, good visuals, and um, and so like, and now we've got like almost not quite motion pictures from Mars, but it's like I said, it, it sort of gets back to it. And like I said, you can follow the, the, the Twitter feed of the Mars of the Curiosity World. I think also too, um, I think like uh, curiosity and opportunity, sort of not curiosity, a spirit. Especially if it's Avi that's still Avi is still running a six-month mission, <laughs> ten years later. Yeah. 
Well, some, some of that now is it draws people in because they're interested and they want to watch that. Yeah. Uh, I think the other thing, too, is that you get news and information that's you know really interesting and people sort of clue in on that. But then there's also the disappointments and things like that. Like they were saying that uh, it has no magnetic, uh, what is that, yeah. magnetic sphere around it. So now you'll never be able to transform, you know, uh, uh, Transform it to uh, you know Earth-like living. It could, but it's not going to last for long because. Right. It's so the out. idea is this might make people drop off since they've got newer science and newer information. Yeah. Like there's never going to be a long-term, like you'd be to terraform Mars. You would be a constant process because you're constantly replacing the volatiles that are being burned off by the solar wind. There was a guy, um, early '90s, wrote a paper called uh, "Terraforming." It outlined this just rapid brute force terraforming method that involved putting big mirrors in orbit to concentrate sunlight into these rays that would vaporize minerals in the ground to thicken the atmosphere, and trying to take big chunks of ice from asteroids and putting them in <laughs> trajectories so that they'd ablate away in the atmosphere and slingshot around and keep adding all this water. And the end result of this is according to his calculations, which he worked out, and I checked them as best as I could. Mathematically, that would kind of suck, but as near as I could tell, he was right. But you end up with Mars covered in this crosswork of canals from this thing, cutting these trenches full of this water delivered from asteroids in about a 200 year span, and it's a cold, shirt sleeve environment. Yeah. Well, that, that was the whole point of King Stanley Robinson's trilogy. Uh, uh, Red Mars, yeah, he Mars, a lot Blue Mars. From that theory, yeah. uh, that guy's and he intentionally be, to compress the, the process so you could tell it the story of like the character's extended life. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, even if you were able to, assuming all the engineering problems that would be involved in doing something outlandish like that, you would still have some maintenance that you have to do because, of course, the atmosphere wants to bleed off. There's not a mass there, but we are talking about geologic time frames. So if you make it and leave it, you've got a few million years before it bleeds off. Yeah. So it's not like a real urgent thing. Yeah, I mean, um, the, the author S.M. Sterling, anybody here know S.M.? Yeah. yeah, he wrote um, a couple of pastiches of Burroughs works. Uh, the first one was set on Venus, and the second one was on Mars. And I thought the Mars book was much more interesting. Those were fun. And he basically, alien space bats come in and terraform Venus and Mars. And, and basically, they, they continually take life forms from Earth to see how they will adapt to the new environments. And the Martian one, basically, when, when in the early 60s, we sent out these the probes we sent out historically, only when we get to Mars, somebody steals the probe for spare parts. Like, there's a picture of a guy, uh, some, a, a, a person coming across to the, the, the Mars probe and picking it up, and then and then it goes dark. It's obviously, they, they salvage it for all that metal, you know? They don't have a lot of metal on Mars. Yes, I remember that, yeah, they were, yeah. years later when they translated what they were saying, it was something like, uh, they'll give us a fortune for this at the university. <laughs> yeah, and the problem that the Mars Society is facing, and it's a human society, because it's based on kidnapped humans, um, is that, yeah, they're, they're, it's been a few million years, and they re their ecosystem that the, the alien space bats created is, is beginning to uh, open up late. They're running out of. They're running out of. The ball. They can visibly see that. Yeah, we're going to have problems. Um, everybody there used to be. There used to be civilization with poles, and now it's sort of been drawing back into the lowlands. Yeah. So the, the problem is done. So. And then of course there's this great mega solution at the end to solve that. So just, okay, that, that's a, that's yeah. Yeah. But it's, uh, it's 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 interesting though because the because on Mars the alien space bats have like create like almost like a a dumb AI to run the planet. And then one, one ruling class is given access to this AI. And so it creates an incredibly stable human society at a fairly level, a high level of technology, but we're not at any kind of technology on Earth. So it's literally a several thousand, it's a thousands of year old high tech society that doesn't really understand its technology. Because yeah. he was trying to figure out, okay, so how could you create the society that John Carter sees in the Burroughs books? Oh, okay, what if this happened? So that, and to me, it's more fascinating than the Earth. Venus is basically, uh, it's, it's a Bronze Age society on Venus. So it's, it's kind of boring. Oh, it's the lost one. What's that? Yeah, yeah, it's the lost one. So 
with in the in the courts of the Crimson Kings was the that was the Mars one. The Mars one, yeah. Of course, the Venus one had Neanderthals with Kalashnikovs, which is a nice one. Yeah. And dinosaurs. Yes. And again, the game too is that the mission, the, the man, the, the missions from Earth to two planets were one-way missions. Basically, you volunteer to go to Mars or to go to Venus, and basically you're a colonist scientist who's going to examine the societies for the planet, and you're going to be there for the rest of your life. Does have to wonder, you know, thinking about those kind of things, is if either one of those planets had been habitable like they were in the 30s pulp sci-fi, just imagine how the space race would have developed if there was actually a livable frontier. When you got there, yeah. 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 It wouldn't be like people assembling ramp, like with the Nazis that assembled a ramp shackle. Mm -hmm. Interplanetary mission as a last gas to keep the Reich going. Yeah. So you've got the space Nazis on Mars or, you know, or space Nazis of Venus. Yeah, so, um, and the other thing is, is even assuming we got a colony out there, and we managed to get them set up with a decent ecosystem, whether they kept it in a bottle beneath, you know, beneath some sort of dome, or they figured out some sort of terraforming, you had started with like 60 to 100 people. How quickly do you think they'd stop paying attention to any orders or any questions from her. Because they've got more important things to do on a daily basis. And a lot of the crap that we come up with just wouldn't make any sense in their environment. Well, to some extent, yeah, I feel that, that has been a, a theme, I think, in, in writing Mars fiction. Like, uh, basically, the, the Mars uh, people can't understand why they have to keep relying on Earth for money for their terraforming project. I mean, don't the Earth people see the importance of these projects? What do they need a return for? It? Can't, shouldn't they just they should just spend the money to this sort of thing? And I think part of it too is they can't ignore the Earth too much because they still need well money or supplies from Earth from Earth to support life on Mars. Yeah. Although, are we going to take questions? Yeah. Oh, you had a question over there. Well, can we start to get off on other bodies than Mars? What about building uh, in space, i.e. Uh, Mars, even if we terraform it, it's only going to get in the continent of Africa. And plus but it's cool. It looks like the Wild West. Like <laughs> outer space is just a big old rock. Well, I think what well it there's is lots of big old rocks that are easy to get to. So oh, now you're, thinking, now, now you're talking logically. Yeah. <laughs> and that's one of the things is that from a purely rational standpoint of resource utilization and building completely space-based habitats actually makes more sense. But we're planes-dwelling pack animals and we like sky. Yeah. <laughs> we want to live on planets. Oh, I'll you to know. Um, just kind of a comment you mentioned, you know, like biologically what would happen if we did live on Mars. And putting aside the whole what radiation does and all that stuff, genetically you only need about maybe one or 2,000 people in order to have a stable enough colony that can sustain itself genetically. Perhaps significantly less depending on how you select. We, the human race has gotten down to maybe about two or 3,000 and it's rebounded. Um, it's happened at least, I think, twice in our evolutionary yeah. development. So you don't need that many people, really. No, it's Which not is good so because the resources aren't very plentiful. The real question is what happens when you have people two or three generations down the line in that sort of, the radiation isn't even so much an issue because you can shield that in all sorts of ways, both technological or just brute force deep tunnels. But we have that 0.38G problem and how is that going to affect fertilization? How is that going to affect development? And well, we look at if it, is it going to be something very major that it just won't work? Or is it going to be something so subtle that it doesn't manifest until a few generations down? Or maybe it just doesn't matter. I mean, human life is designed for 1G. And we know now if you put it in orbit, um, you get you get bone density problems, mm -hmm. and, and other physiological problems. So even in 1 third G, you're still going to end up with problems. Yes, sir. So there are other bodies in the solar system that have really interesting possibilities for life. You know geysers of you know some kind of spray out into space and things Oceans like that so space. what's the chances that mars is no longer going to be the the favorite 
and we're going to go to one of these other ones instead. I think it's because accessibility, I think, in part, because it, um, Mars is the closest, and the travel time is not totally ridiculous, whereas to get out to Ohio or Callisto, it, it takes you a lot, lot longer, and so you're exposed to the hazards of interplanetary space travel a lot, lot, a lot, lot, a lot longer. So well, then there's also just like those psychological aspects, too, that Mars is not only closer from the practical standpoint, but it's, you know, it looks like it's a big places rock. on Earth, sort yeah. of. It's, it's not like you get a completely different feel looking at pictures from the surface of Enceladus or something. Where when you look like, at the pictures of Mars, oh, it looks like Earth. Ice. You look at the pictures of, of you look at the pictures of a Jovian moon. It looks like a Jovian moon. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's not a nice field or Mordor. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's one thing why why Pluto was so popular all of a sudden. It's because oh wow, it looks like a real planet. Same thing with Titan. Yeah, so maybe Titan. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Well, well you could. Yeah, after all, if you're watching the Expanse on TV right now, yeah. you know, they they took Mars as a enclosed environment. <laughs> Stepping stone doesn't make quite as much sense for going up to the belt because there's you are then going into this gravity well that you then have to launch yourself back out of. But if you have a platform for a mile Mars. Yeah, if you have a, some kind of an orbital platform, you could use that as. It is easier to build a, an elevator, a space elevator yes, on Mars than it's on Earth. Yeah. You got those two cute little moons yeah. too. Yeah, but it's like yeah, for for resources for use on Earth, the asteroid belt makes a lot of sense because you launch something, it's going to take you the same amount energy to get to Mars and get out of the belt. It's just going to take you a little bit more time. And then you can dump stuff kind of down into that gravity well towards the sun, and it's pretty much free delivery. Whereas any resources that you mine on Mars really makes sense to use on Mars rather than trying to export them anywhere because you're not going to be able to do that profitably, which is why Mars really makes sense as a colonial sort of thing if you're going to send people there to live and build kind of your beta site is a backup sort of <laughs> yeah. whereas for pure resource utilization. Yes, sir. Well, I'm ignorant about the atmosphere of Mars, but if I understand it right, you have to have oxygen to be able to breathe on Mars, right? Yes. So first off, you'd have to have a huge tank, I mean a really huge tank, yep. and you'd have to have the means to be able to replenish that tank. Yeah. Well, I don't think the oxygen, like Mars does have a carbon dioxide it's atmosphere. It's very thin carbon dioxide atmosphere. It's so, so you could crack oxygen out of that. Well, it also has water, so isn't it like, oxygen isn't isn't nitrogen sort of like one of the, big, the, the biggest bottlenecks on, on Mars? Well, yes, yeah. Mars is very, very deficient in nitrogen. So, yeah. Yeah. That's going to be a problem if they ever want to set up any kind of greenhouse operations or anything. They're going to have to. Well, I remember, um, was it Robert Charles Wilson wrote a novel work um, called Spin? Where all of a sudden the Earth time on Earth passes much slower than time everywhere else in, in the universe, as far as we know. And so what they do is they they launch um, a call, like a, a Mars Direct one-way mission, and they do it over a series of time. The idea is that oh, that will evolve into this high-tech civilization that will come and figure out what's going on and save us. And eventually the uh, civilization on Mars does get back to them, and they send exactly one person. Because that's all they have the resources to do, <laughs> even though like even though their civilization has been on Mars for thousands of years. And he mentions that one of the bottlenecks is this lack of nitrogen. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? I think um, get, that actually brings up um, in popular culture the Larry Niblin novels. Um, their Earth basically in his one of his futures Earth splits into Earth and the Belt. And the belt says, oh, you can have Mars. We'll throw in Mars because it's useless, you know. <laughs> so Mars becomes this, like, in, in, sort of like this little scientific backwater. And then eventually one day they figure out, well, there were Martians there, but one of the, one of the uh, aliens that, uh, that Niven has basically killed them all because he thought they might be threatening humans some way. But, uh, but yeah, literally, like, Mars was considered like this, like, little piece of useless real estate because it is down, the gravity well. It really depends on what you do with it. Yeah. I've talked to people over the years that seem to think it's a great mining destination. And it's like, no, it really isn't. <laughs> but 
Well, that's one of the one of the biggest things in the expanse that you have to expect. Uh, the expanse is this new show in sci-fi, set uh, a couple hundred years maybe from now, and Mars is the possessor of this huge high-tech space game. And then you have to wonder, okay, so basically it's not the Mars, it's the belt, and they just pretend they're from Mars. Because right? the resources would have had to come from elsewhere in the solar system to build that name. Although it's a question. <laughs>